Hello. I always default to speaking loud enough that I probably don't need a mic by accident, and then I realize that I'm, of course, have a mic. I'm, it, I know it sounds really booming. Is this like, this is good? Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, so I, I usually start by uh, giving the caveats about this year's talk. Uh, the, uh, but like half the caveats are actually part of the talk this year because they were actually highly relevant to the talk. Uh, the two caveats that I have are um, the, I've got a small amount of blue text that apparently is not rendering, but it's such a small amount of blue text throughout the thing that I'm just going to describe it when it comes up rather than try to quickly go through and change the, uh, the font color. Uh, and then the other one is that I think I've gotten even less sleep than I ever have previously doing this talk. Uh, something like an hour and a half, maybe, maybe an hour. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm probably, though, not going to fall off the end of the slide deck, though. That, 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 not like off the you know, complete end of it, but I actually think that the slides are going to remind me of what all the slides are. We'll see, though. All right, so my talk this year is Hindsight Can Be 50 50. Uh, and that says 360i dev 2018 J Freeman open parentheses SOAR close parentheses. Uh, I usually start, though, by doing a quick explanation of who I am, who's this guy in front of you, and why are you listening to them about this particular topic. Um, so I'm Sork. This, by the way, is the only image that I actually have in my talk this year, which is very different for talks that I normally wear, just extremely image heavy. Uh, I speak every year 360 IDEV about device freedoms and politics. I wrote Anacrino, the first .NET decompiler. It's actually relevant. I made Quotable, an early-ish Facebook app, so uh, it was an app that you could uh, keep track of quotes that your friends said at the very beginning when the Facebook app uh, process launched. Also really relevant. I developed Cydia, an alternative to the App Store uh, used on iOS. I'm now in charge of technology at Orchid, building the software they wrote on Silicon Valley season four. <laughs> So back to the title, Hindsight Can Be 50-50. Uh, this is actually a play on, uh, oh, interestingly, the, okay, there's actually a lot of blue text, but that's okay, I'll just, I'll just I'll read it when it comes up. Uh, this is actually a quote uh, from Mike Lee at 4.45 p.m. later today. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, however, uh, you know, it, it, that is, of course, itself based upon the quote, uh, hindsight is always 2020, said by Samuel Billy Wilder. Um, but Cam Newton, the football player, uh, said once that hindsight's always 50-50. I mean 2020. <laughs> Whatever the number is, who cares? Which probably means that he got like a 50-50 shot at getting that one right. Um, but so why, why, why is hindsight interesting or important? Uh, and uh, that, that kind of comes down to the quote from George Santanaya, uh, Santayana. Uh, Those who refuse to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Now, I say that. Um, but if you actually try to look it up online, you'll come across those who do not learn history are doomed to repeat it. Uh, then you'll finally figure out that the actual quote is those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it, which means it would probably have just, we've already failed. <laughs> uh, which itself, uh, it, so many people attribute this quote to somebody else. Those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it by Edmund Burke. Uh, but what he said was people will not look forward to prosperity who never look backward to their ancestors, which means that we're just... Yeah, this is just, we're really bad at remembering anything, and so we need to think through how we actually can remember the past in order to make certain that we can succeed in predicting the future. And so Mike talks about the past, uh, and Mike's talk is at least supposedly about the future. All right, so how can we obtain this, this feeling of hindsight? So one, one process is uh, archaeology. So that says Indiana Jones. Uh, archaeology is a search for fact, not truth. If it's truth you're interested in, Dr. Kyrie's philosophy class is right down the hall. Um, so archaeology is essentially the study of, um, of uh, the artifacts that have been left behind, uh, cultural remains as well as, as well as human remains, but it's, it's like the study of, of human past. Paleontology, an old paleontological joke, in joke proclaims a million evolution is a tale told by teeth mating to produce slightly altered descendant teeth, Stephen Jay Gould. Um, so uh, paleontology being the study of fossil records. Uh, physics, uh, while physics and mathematics may tell us how the universe began, they are not much use in predicting human behavior because they are far too, there are far too many equations to solve, Stephen Hawking. Uh, and uh, though in, in some cases you actually were kind of, are running past the end of what you're actually going to feel you're able to learn from looking at anything and 
you're going to be looking at religion. Religion and science are the two conjugated faces or phases of one and the same complete act of knowledge, the only one which can embrace the past and future of evolution and so contemplate, measure, and fulfill them. Pierre Teilhard de Tergin, and I cannot pronounce that at all. Um, but of course, in many cases, we come back down to the word history. And I actually ended up in uh, like multiple conversations over the last few days trying to actually determine what, what the definition of history is. And that actually ends up being a running thing through this talk. Um, but so uh, Arnold Toynbee from the Oxford English Dictionary. No, no, no. This one's this one. This one. I, that's what I'm. That's what I'm going to mess up. I'm going to keep messing up who these people are. Arnold Toynbee was a, um, a British historian. That was a particular note, I believe. Uh, history is a Greek word which means literally just investigation. All right. What is history? So, Francesco Petrarch, Quiras uh, Maria Donis Historia Pom de Romana Laus. What else then is all of history but the praise of Rome? Okay. <laughs> So I've come here to bury Caesar, though, not to praise him. So let's actually talk about the fall of Rome, uh, which you might then start to think is, uh, OK, uh, Jay's really jumped the shark here. Uh, now, like, if anyone asks you what did Jay talk about, Jay talked about the fall of the Roman Empire at the tech conference that I was at. Um, but, but I think there's actually something informative here, which is you start to look at uh, what we know about the fall of the Roman Empire, and you end up with all sorts of really weird theories that go into it. Uh, I mean, there's, there's some, some that just kind of feel really stereotypical, like, like if you just think about Rome, you might think about some of these things, like corrupt government. Um, the uh, government was so corrupt that it just ended up uh, uh, tearing itself apart. Uh, rising Christianity. Um, there were uh, the Roman uh, Empire was essentially reliant upon its polytheistic uh, religion process that then allowed the um, people who were running it to be considered gods. And so as Christianity started to rise, that undermined the ability for the Roman Empire to maintain its control. The invading barbarians. Um, the uh, the, just the obvious thing that they were actually that the barbarians were invading, and it was actually it was, it was, eventually they won. Uh, the arrival of the Huns, which was causing mass migrations through Europe, which was then leading to esen essentially a, um, an attempt by the Roman people to um, uh, help some of those people by letting them into the Roman Empire. But then that also, that led to a large number of people who were second-class citizens in Rome. That then led to an uprising. Um, they just weirdly in the Aristotle aristocratic class stopped marrying, they stopped having children, it just, the, the, like, um, the, the bloodlines they're trying to maintain started to fall apart. Um, they decided that as part of a giant administrative effort that they were going to construct the Eastern Empire, uh, and then the Eastern Empire was going to be separately administered up to the top level, but then the problem is that they kind of just sliced the empire in two, causing some serious issues being able to um, maintain organization. They hired mercenaries for their uh, uh, for their for their war efforts, um, who of course have very little loyalty. I guess it's a second column. It's a massive logistics nightmare. It's one of the things you often think about because it's it's just such a large territory that they were unable to maintain control of all of it at the same time. Uh, we see uh, economic problems because they were reliant upon the the continual growth and the slave labor that they were able to obtain by continually bringing on more bringing in more people as slaves. And so then, as they were slowing down their growth process because they had grown everywhere, uh, they were running out of the ability to maintain their economy. There were two major plagues that just killed nearly everybody, just destroying entire cities. Uh, there was extremely high unemployment rates um, because the um, uh, I actually I was going to. And if you're getting how, exactly why this, this is related to the uh, the, the slave labor problem, uh, there was actually uh, high unemployment. Um, there was no technological advancement at some point. They just stopped working on on tech, and so they just kind of started falling behind. One of my favorite theories that you end up coming across more in recent time is lead poisoning. Uh, they liked to boil wine in. Uh, lead caskets, uh, and uh, the, there's this idea that just all of Rome just fell to lead poisoning. Um, but then there's this, also this thing, and when you actually start searching for this, you have maybe Rome never fell. Okay, and, and this is, when we get to this point, you're just like, what are we doing with history? Okay, so if you were apparently, if you were to have actually gone to the Byzantine Empire, which we think of as the thing that came after the Roman Empire, and you were to ask them who are you? They would say, we are the Romans. And if you were to ask them, where are you? They would say, we are in the Roman Empire. It was actually an invention of his, his, um, uh, his historicians? Okay. <laughs> of, no, it's not historiography. I'm getting messed up because I'm thinking of historiographers. Historiography is the study of historians. There we go. So it's the, uh, it was actually an invention of uh, historians uh, that they actually end up constructing all this terminology surrounding that. Um, maybe it's like the case that you, if you were to actually argue about the continuity of this empire, Rome never really fell. But now you can also ask the question, why did Rome last so long? 
And that, I think that's a very valid question considering how many things ended up going wrong with the Roman Empire. I mean, I just listed off so many theories and we're not certain which ones actually contributed to the failure. Well, they all sort of contributed to the failure. We apparently just have no clue what's actually going on here. So coming back now to what is history. History is mostly guessing. The rest is prejudice. Will Durant. And so now one more very much faster side story, the fall of Easter Island. So Easter's, Easter's isolation makes it the clearest example of a society that destroyed itself by overexploiting its own resources. This is a story that you would have been hearing um, quite often from uh, the last uh, 20 years or so. This is uh, Jared Diamond in his book, uh, Collapse. Uh, and the premise was that Easter Island is the island with all the statues on it, and that when you go there, there are no trees anymore. There's just a bunch of statues and the remains of some people that used to live there. And you try to figure out well, what happened to them, and it just seems very obvious that they spent all of their, that they used up all of their wood um, building uh, scaffolding and, and, and maintaining the society for some period of time. Uh, they built large numbers of statues, and then they all perished because they ran out of wood, and they ran out of all the food and all the other resources. Um, there were even stories that uh, there were people on surrounding islands um, that had kind of remembered that there were great seafaring people uh, and that, well, no, they used up all the wood and they couldn't construct boats anymore, so they were unable to maintain their civilization. But now there's this new thought process, which is uh, it seems that they actually had rats, uh, very large numbers of them on the, on the island, uh, and the very large number of rats were sufficient to actually sustain the population there. Uh, they also, um, this is not charging my laptop. Still recording. Okay. Sorry about that. I, I actually was like, I like, and I plugged it in. I was like, I wasn't looking at it very much, and I was just thinking, okay, this is just like, I mean, they've got this one adapter here. It must charge my laptop because I mean, I only have one port, and they probably thought of this. <laughs> All right. So, um, the. There we go. The, the, the depressing thought now, though, is that they simply adapted. That they simply just got so used to the idea that they were running low on trees, and then they just kept going, and then they just didn't have any food on the island, except they, they, now they were killing rats, and then they, their population started to adjust. And then over the course of the next, you know, however long it took, their civilization died off, but it died off not in this kind of like massive bang, but in this slow trickle of, I kind of remember what it was like to have food, but now I, now I know rats. Um, the, uh, it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of a depressing point in some ways. And so this is one of the, one of the things that is coming up about Easter Island is this, was this a success of Easter Island or is this a complete failure of Easter Island? Um, is this a, like a, a, a success of humanity or is it a failure of humanity? Uh, and, uh, this is something that weirdly is relevant in a little bit. So now that I'm done with all this, like this stuff, what, what is history? Um, Mais qui alors cette vérité historique la plupart du temps une fable convenue à Napoléon Bonaparte? What then is generally speaking the truth of history? It's a fable agreed upon, um, and he is actually quoting uh, um, Bernard Le Bouvier de Fontenelle, which is I cannot, I've not even, I took four years of French, but I, I have no hope of even getting through like a quarter of this. Um, but the English of this is uh, for the Greek fables were not like our novels, which are intended as stories and not as histories. There are no ancient histories other than these fables, which is an entirely different point. Like Napoleon was quoting this guy and like he totally misunderstood the point. Uh, or Napoleon had a much stronger point. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not certain which is, which is true, but I'm going to go over the fall of Microsoft. Um, so I have, I have a somewhat controversial opinion on, on, on this, uh, and, uh, and we'll see if how many people here start throwing tomatoes at me or something. Um, so the fable of Internet Explorer uh, is that Microsoft did not care about web standards. Internet Explorer was unrelated to Windows. Microsoft didn't care about the web at all. Microsoft pushed for proprietary scripting. And Microsoft stopped bothering after IE6. Now what this led to is a monopolistic destruction of the Internet. Um, leading to, I mean, with, with, with Internet Explorer 6 sitting around in stagnation. I mean, the story, right, is that Microsoft noticed that the Internet was vaguely important, made, wanted to make certain that Netscape did not take the Internet, sat around long enough to care to crush Netscape, and then immediately stopped working on Internet Explorer. All right, so I'm going to take these one at a point. So Microsoft did not care about web standards. Um, the argument here is that um, if you try to use a lot of old versions of Internet Explorer, they might not support something that you were expecting to support. They support it in some weird way. Um, and uh, there's uh, this, this, you know, this argument that all other, well, at least this part of the fable, that other web browsers were better about all of the interoperability with the web standards. 
Actually, no. So Netscape Navigator 2 is a standard on the web. Uh, according to some surveys, it is used by 70% of all web surfers. Well, this is from a tutorial um, from forever ago. Uh, even though unauthorized, but, but, but Netscape was just full. Uh, so it had like a, it had like a nine to monopoly position on the internet at the time. But it was just full of these random extensions to it, which are the extensions that we all hate. Okay? So even though unauthorized, the Netscape extensions have become commonly accepted tags and are used in many web documents in educators' introduction to HTML. Center. The center tag is one of the most popular Netscape extensions. See the HTML center tag below. All the stuff involving fonts that you have to like weirdly do and mark up and all the stuff with the attributes there, that was all Netscape wedging stuff into HTML. And uh, at the time, the W3C did have CSS and was begging Netscape to implement it. And Netscape was like, no, we have no interest in building your silly little CSS thing. Um, so, uh, from Van Delaney on the W3 mailing list, Net Netscape seems to have conveniently ignored certain HTML tags which they don't want to use. They talk all sweet and innocent, Netscape remains committed to supporting HTML3, but we all know that's bullshit. Shigeki Irons on the W3 mailing list. Netscape is young and horny. Its market, by and large, does not understand what the possibilities are, it does not understand what's being denied by choosing Netscape exclusively, and does not yet care to learn. This is not a situation where one can reasonably expect technological maturity. Charles Payton Tyler. W3 mailing list. Instead, we get kludgy frames to practically trap the user onto a page, fonts that we have to put everywhere as opposed to putting it in one style sheet file, and image maps that are not text compatible on the same page. From the special edition using HTML second edition, many of Netscape's HTML extensions differ from the proposed HTML3 standard in one big, important way. Netscape has implemented many page formatting options as custom HTML tags. HTML3 proposes to handle formatting by a technique called style sheets. In an explorer was actually welcomed with, like, Massive open arms. Excellent. It's really encouraging to see a vendor supplying a DTD for a change. Uh, Gerald Oscar from the WC mailing list. Excellent. Okay, all you folks who told me that hell would freeze over because vendors issued SG, um, that was not, I didn't change that, that was in the original. Would freeze over before vendors issued SGML DTDs as documentation. I told you so, and to all the folks that fought the good fight with me, aren't you glad you did? Daniel W. Connolly, W3 mailing list. So you might be wondering, there's like two excellent. Uh, did I, I hit up X, here we go. So uh, this is the 90s. We said excellent a lot, right? <laughs> we bought it here also in the 90s with me. I mean, like, you remember excellent, right? So that says Wayne Campbell. <laughs> uh, so um, uh, might Microsoft come to the rescue in order to eat Netscape's launch? That was the premise on the W3 mailing list. And they actually were happy with what Internet Explorer was doing. All right, Internet Explorer was unrelated to Windows. So there was this massive argument that um, Internet Explorer was just some kind of, was like, Microsoft was essentially like bundling it into Windows in order to crush Netscape, and there was no other reason to do that. Um, they actually, so, I, I mean, actually, a lot of you probably, well, not really, I mean, a lot of you, but at least some of you remember when I was here years ago, and I was, I mean, I was, I was a Windows user. I mean, I was sitting here with my ThinkPad. Um, I, I remember all of this, and, that was actually, there was some tight integration going on. They had this idea that they were doing, which is the true web integration, they called it. And they started off with some things that felt a little like tag So they did the active desktop interface um, that they were allowed you to like stick HTML on your desktop. Um, but they were kind of threading that through everything. And they had this, they had this idea of instead of having Windows Explorer and Internet Explorer, they would have something called Single Explorer. And that Single Explorer would be the exact same interface you use to browse local files and that you would use to browse internet documents. And uh, the address bar was, it was a unified address bar, and they would just go, and, 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 and this worked really well on Windows because everything is divided into these com objects with a centralized registry that allows you to just embed parts of other applications into other applications, and so Internet Explorer itself is a component that was easily able to be reusable and everything, and so Internet Explorer was, was now like part of Explorer itself. Um, you were able to uh, customize the way which everything, like all the Explorer windows were rendered by using HTML in order to do that. It's the kind of thing where you'd imagine that like another short period of time and Microsoft was going to be doing electron type applications where you'd be able to, I mean, that's just, that's, that's how they tended to think, okay? Microsoft didn't care about the web at all. Okay, I, I, I also cannot find evidence for this. I, I've seen arguments that, that essentially say that like, okay, Bill Gates decided to take the Internet Explorer team, stick it onto the Windows team, make them subservient to it, decided that instead of using their monopoly on Internet, on Internet Explorer to take over search and, and all these Internet services, that instead they were going to uh, just, you know, sit around and just crush the Internet to this and I got the impression that what they wanted to do, and I've read a bunch of articles on this, like, like of people at the time talking to people at Microsoft, um, looking at like internal documents and stuff. I mean, it's just the the point was to was to was to make the. I mean, yes, they were trying to maybe crush some of the like the 
separate web browser parts. Netscape had this vision that, that the operating system would be fully commoditized and that Netscape would own the layer on top, charging everybody uh, uh, like their 20 or I think even one point like $40 cost in order to like sit on top of that. Um, they wanted, Microsoft wanted to see all of the internet stuff so baked into the operating system um, that you would of course want to use Windows. Um, but they were pushing hard on web technology and, to, and therefore on things like Explorer. The Outlook web access that they shipped with Exchange 5 um, was essentially Exchange. You could access it via web page. Um, they invented all of the, I mean, they, they, they both designed, developed, and, and, and came up with a concept for all the stuff that we ended up later calling Ajax. Um, with a uh, the XML HTTP ActiveX control that they had, that they shipped with um, uh, Internet Explorer five, I think it was, um, which then ended up getting uh, copied by Netscape uh, a couple of years later, and then standardized as XML HTTP request, which is the basis of how we end up communicating with servers. But Microsoft was using utilizing all that in order to build Outlook Web Access, which I don't think gets anywhere near enough credit as being one of the well, being really the, the literally the first um, application that was. Um, being able to like update itself automatically. It weirdly, like Google Maps gets a lot of credit for that. Although I mean, Google Maps revolutionized something else. It was the ability to do like complicated rendering. Um, but I also, I mean, no one seems to ever remember this one. I mean, maybe somebody, maybe somebody here does. Um, but there was a service called Microsoft Passport, and Microsoft Passport was designed to be single login for everything, single uh, wallet experience for everything. Uh, and they had this vision that they were essentially, and they managed to get a bunch of companies to temporarily buy onto it. This is uh, that says at the bottom. But, 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 the thing that you're is never relevant. That's always just a URL in case somebody wanted to find it later. The thing that's run right below it, which is always a little short, is, is who said the thing. This is Microsoft um, in a press release. Uh, they had this idea that they were going to be constructing more services like this and that they were going to um, be working. And, and that, I mean, Passport itself was something that, I mean, honestly, an internet with Passport instead of Facebook and Google, I almost would prefer it. And there are reasons I'll get to in a second. All right, Microsoft pushed for proprietary scripting. Um, so they had ActiveX controls embedded deep throughout everything, um, and which was a security nightmare in some ways. Uh, and the, uh, um, the, they, they had uh, visual basic scripting embedded uh, in like, VBScript as a scripting language in Explorer. And I don't have a slide for this. Um, but Netscape, Netscape also, I mean, Netscape just decided to throw JavaScript in there. And they threw JavaScript in there with an agreement with, with uh, Sun related to Java. And so they had Java in there. And you were able to import Java classes using Live Connect from the JavaScript that you had. And to the people who cared about the web, it was just as proprietary. Uh, it, was, it was a language that um, only Netscape uh, had, had developed and had a single implementation of, and, that, um, and then reliant upon a runtime that Sun was just very, very strict about usage and distribution of, um, that they had made a special licensing agreement deal with Netscape in order to do the distribution for. Um, and the Really, the premise is this, like, one way of looking at what Microsoft did there is that they implemented JScript in order to cause a second implementation that they then forced the standardization process on in order to get everyone to play with, and then actually now we've got a standard ECMAScript. Um, okay. And then this one, Microsoft stopped bothering after IE6. I think this is kind of like the point in some sense, right? I mean, this is the thing where it's just like, okay, and then when they won, then they gave up, and that's what happened there, right? And this is the one slide that I kind of regret some of the color here. Um, so, I think what actually happened is that Microsoft, as an entire company, died. That like, there's this like premise that Microsoft was this really strong company, and they took control of everything. And then once they took control of everything, they rested on their laurels because they didn't need to do anything anymore. And I think that a better way of looking at it is, is that Microsoft stretched a little bit too far, caused some people to get really angry at them, and then got really, really hit. They, and, and the process of that was combination of demoralizing and destructive internally. And so I've got, so I've got a few different timelines overlapping here. I've got the timelines of the lawsuits that were going on against them. I've got the timelines of um, Windows uh, releases, Internet Explorer releases, Mac OS releases, and executives uh, coming and going. And so what we see is, is that there's, there's this, like, if you look at operating system releases, operating system releases are going fine. Uh, and they've got Windows 95, Windows 98, Windows ME, Windows XP, and then there's just this giant gap where nothing happens until Windows Vista, which was a nightmare. There's, um, you, we look at the, and we look at Internet Explorer, and that's the blue one. And so we see on the left there that that's um, 1999, Internet Explorer 5. Then in 2000, Internet Explorer 5.5. 2001, Internet Explorer 6. And then there's just effectively nothing. It's not just that they 
lost that they, they like won internet, and once they won the uh, the internet, they decided that they no longer needed to do um, they no longer needed to do an explorer. They they at the same time, like if, if that argument were correct, you would then expect that they would be noticing what's going on with operating systems and deciding to crush hard. You know, do the Microsoft thing, just destroying, right? And so now, what's going on with, with Apple? Steve Jobs returns in 1997. Uh, we see uh, Mac OS 9 come out in 1999, 10.0 come out in 2001, and then we see the rise of OS X seemingly, maybe, un maybe unnoticed for a while. And then we see at the, a little bit after uh, Vista comes out, we see 10.5, which many people will think of, you know, that's the, that, that, that's the version that nailed it, right? Maybe 10.6. But like right around there, we see Microsoft just starting to just fumble with like Vista and like they're just not, they, something, something happened in here, right? And so, and I think it's this giant panel of lawsuits that then led to Bill Gates stepping down and leaving uh, Steve Ballmer in charge of the company. Uh, Steve Ballmer was kind of excited about, I mean, you know, the developers, 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 but, and I, and I can't, I don't actually have that much bad to say, other than the fact that it feels like a 90s company throughout the course of this period, I don't have that much bad to say about, like, the, what they were doing with developer experiences. I mean, .NET was the rise throughout this entire region, right? It's just almost like the entire company stopped doing everything that they were doing, started working on .NET, and then eventually realized, oh shit, we just lost control of, uh, of our operating system. Uh, we've, we, the internet has now decided to crush us, uh, and now what? Uh, and so they started scrambling with Vista, Windows 7. There was this period of just like decline as Apple started to rise now with uh, the iPhone, the iPad, and, and everything. And then eventually they got rid of Steve Jobs, put in the new guy whose name I'm not remembering right now. Uh, and we suddenly started seeing this weird turnaround. So I think, I think like, like when I look back at Microsoft, I don't look at it as there was this monopolist that managed to uh, crush people and then give up. I think that's true, by the way. I mean, for this word, I really believe in monopolist. But I don't see it as they crushed everyone and gave up. I see it as we crushed them, and then they had nothing left, and they just kind of evaporated. But we were left with a dying monopoly, and, and, and it is different. We don't have a good process for transitioning away from a dying monopoly. Like, we didn't, like, when we, when we, when we decided to have that settlement for the Department of Justice with them, we didn't have a, what, what next? So now I look at Google, right? And Google, to me, feels like Microsoft. So Google, although worse, right? Like, Microsoft wanted to run the software on your computers, but they didn't actually want to know everything about you. They didn't want to store everything in the cloud or anything. They started building all of that stuff because they had to compete with Google. Um, I think Google is a fundamentally more dangerous vision. Um, Google has way more control over all society because of the, the particular place that they exist in society. Um, Google is now operating, uh, you know, 20 years later, under much more lenient antitrust, uh, and it seems like they're allowed to get away with a lot more. As far as I'm concerned, Google is exactly the same embrace, extend, extinguish strategy that Microsoft did, and somehow has managed to use it against Java, the web, and email without anyone caring. Uh, and now Google Android owns 88% of the market for smartphones. In 1997, Microsoft had only 86.3% of the desktop computing market. And at the time, people were always like, oh, my, you know, Bill Gates is saying that like, you know, nearly 90% isn't a monopoly. How silly is he? And it's like, okay, well, I, Google now has more for smartphone operating systems than Microsoft did at that time. We should be ridiculing Google over this and destroying Google over this, and we're not. All right, what is history? History will be kind to me, for I intend to write it. The fall of the Android Open Source Project. So I've, I've poked at this at, in previous talks, but uh, I'm not, I've done, I, there's a slide I actually made a long time ago for your previous talk, and then I never actually did it, because it was another one of these giant sets of dates. The definition of open, so say Andy Rubin said once that the definition of open is that you can just download the source code for Android, build it, and, and uh, build it, and I guess I just built. But he didn't have make install, okay? I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but essentially, if you start staring at it, there was actually a window of time when Android was fully closed source, and that window of time when Android was fully closed source was corresponded with Amazon saying that they were going to release the Kindle Fire, and that the Kindle Fire was going to be a tablet using Android before Google felt ready to have tablets on Android, and then suddenly, Android's not open source anymore. Uh, it's closed source for a while. Um, and they, they kind of took advantage of some things that were like going on, like kernel.org getting hacked and the Android code. Well, it was hosted on kernel.org. I guess you can't get it anymore. And it's like, yeah, I know you can set up a server. Um, and, the, and the timeline is, I mean, like Kindle Fire shipped and then like two days later then they kind of, uh, sorry, um, sorry, it was the Kindle Fire shipped and then like one day before the Android 
uh, source code became open again. I was just like, yeah. The, the downfall of Android open source product has been interesting because what we've essentially seen is that um, uh, Google, when they first announced it, they were going to start doing it in public. Uh, and they immediately just kind of get dropped that. It was, it was, the idea was that they were going to do all the development on the public branch so you could see it live, and instead of doing it inside of Google and tossing it over the wall every six months, uh, they gave up. Um, they decided to shift everything to using Google Play services uh, so that you had to rely upon closed source parts of the operating system to do basic things like notification. They started replacing all the stock applications, uh, including the web browser and now messaging, and, uh, and those have been closed source, although, you know, the web browser, web browser is open source, right? But actually, when they released Chrome for Android for the first three years, it was closed source fully. Um, and then, uh, and now, Google just last month announced that due to the EU's $5 billion fine and subsequently being required to no longer bundle Chrome with Android, they might be uh, forced to start charging for Android and change its license. So we're possibly about to see Android become fully closed source just as they've now just completely taken over the market on everything uh, and uh, weirdly in response to an antitrust, like that's the response to antitrust. Um, what, what is history? History is the sum total of things that could have been avoided. The fall of jailbreak. So I get asked a question a lot. I mean, are you, are you still working on this idea? What's going on with jailbreak? Like, I haven't, is anything going on with jailbreak? I don't really see anything going on with jailbreak. Um, there are a few things like symptoms, right? So uh, iOS started to feel more complete to users. Um, it went, once, and once they started adding more features, it became more difficult to say, oh, you're clearly missing this, therefore you should jailbreak. Apple started, in fact, throwing in the kitchen sink. I mean, like, uh, I mean, I, it's, maybe it's weird to say this, but it just seems like Steve Jobs died, and then they just, Apple just started, like other people at Apple were like, okay, well now that the filter's gone, let's just throw everything in. Uh, and, uh, and it's just weird stuff, like gestures that like I just like, never imagine anyone would ever figure this out. And like, no, they threw that in there and it kind of like feels like a jailbreak functionality almost, like it's so weirdly wedged in there um, that uh, it, it started to get to the point where it was like, well, what are we even building? Um, Apple decided to start prioritizing fixing OS bugs. They used to just kind of like put that off and like anytime there was a bug that did it, wasn't like a core serious like remote access security bug or whatever. Now they actually fix them all very quickly. The core jailbreak community left a long time ago. Uh, there are few people who were remaining, honestly had a really bad sense of humor. Um, they, 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 for example, release jailbreaks and associate them on purpose um, with branding that was related to Kim Jong Il. And it's like, you know, when the jailbreak team in China was officially releasing things and we all liked them and they were like, and we're having to defend them because, you know, racist people were like, oh, you know, China's, people in China don't trust anyone in China. Now you're like purposely associating something with, with like a group of that virtually everyone thinks is bad. That's weird. Um, and they, uh, and, and in the process of doing that, Sorry. In the process of this, also, they would tend to release like infinite beta versions uh, that never actually did anything. Uh, and then the developer community kind of led into this death spiral, whereby without users, because jailbreaks were complicated to use, Apple was fixing all the interesting bugs and the you no know, reason to do it. Without users there, there are few, there's a smaller market for developers to bother building anything, which means there's less reason for users to do it, which means that there are fewer users doing it, which means there's a smaller market, which means that there are fewer the spiral. Okay. Now. What's interesting about this, in some sense, is that this gets watching night. I actually have a bullet point on this. All right, so jailbreak in hindsight. So one thing that was kind of broken, in some sense, is that the user community was reliant upon teenagers. And first of all, they've had an infinite amount of time, and they have really variable schedules on everything in their lives, and they are also volatile. Uh, and that volatility caused all sorts of problems maintaining a maintaining the people who felt that they, like, well, I don't want to have to get into a screaming argument over this. I just want to be able to, 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 to do something interesting here. It was really difficult to, to get all the people together at the same time. Um, few of the users actually shared the vision. So, and then, by the way, I should, I should maybe make a little more clear. So it's just like, this is, this is like me trying to like analyze out, based upon the symptoms, what happened, right? Like this is the hindsight as opposed to the history. So the users, like, we were trying to build an open, free device that did not have centralized control. Whereas I had a bunch of users who were essentially saying, Jay, why don't you have centralized control over it? Why don't you make a curated experience that is just all Sorc all the time and like control everything? And I'm like, because that that's totally not what I wanted to do. That's not what any of the people who were doing the core jailbreak community in the, the beginning of it wanted to do. We wanted to have this system whereby it was an open source package manager that had no like really privileged package points and that you could build your own package repository and install it. In fact, in other, in other countries, people like the entire country would often use a third party package repository. My personal strategy was honestly nonsensical. 
So uh, I had this, and this, this is actually ties into the Easter Island story. I had this concept that what was gonna happen is that eventually we were going to use up all the wood and that then the civilization would die in this massive bang. And when that massive bang occurred, we would then be able to go to the copyright office and be able to make a point about the fact that people love jailbreaking, you seem to like jailbreaking. Can we continue to, to do this, what do we need? Is there like a law that we need to have in order to make it so that Apple can't make a closed down device? Like, we've got all these companies suddenly in a lurch. But that's not what happened. Instead, we may do. And I say we, I, I, I just was sitting there in horror and, and confusion trying to understand what was going on as this was all, going, as this was all playing, playing out. But I'm just like, now the jailbreaks no longer do the thing that you think that they do. They no longer do it in a way that feels safe. I can't recommend it to somebody else. Uh, it, it's buggy. It's due to the bugs that we're, that, that we're like, you're being forced to use. And it's like, why can't, can we just stop? Can we just like stop? And just like, just like all say we're quit? But the thing is, but they don't share the vision. And so without, if the users don't share the vision and, the, and, and, and everyone is essentially like status jockeying, um, partly because of the fact that they're, they're teenagers trying to like make a name for themselves in the world, you end up with this, this thing where it's just like there's no cohesive concept of what we're doing. And the, the death spiral then ended up leading to, now when I talk to you about jailbreaking, they're like, oh, that's something, I, I remember doing that a long time ago. Didn't it? Yeah, I remember it being kind of buggy, it didn't really work. Uh, they have memories from friends, it was all bad. And it's like, but if you did it in like iOS 6 or iOS 7, it was great. It was extremely stable. It had all sorts of cool functionality. And it's just like, if we could have just killed it at the right time. Um, we probably shouldn't have done our jailbreak. It was essentially just this, like, uh, there's, and there's a weird history surrounding this one, too, that there should have been an RCD, uh, and there was all sorts of, like, there was, like, a mistake. There was, like, a, like a time machine-related, like, one week, if I could go back and change one tiny thing. Um, but, like, uh, this ended up just leading to this, 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 like, pit where people were able to just generate more hate and more problems and we tried to fix it with more and more complicated and interesting moderation and it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. Um, and then we, as in like the, well, this we, uh, these last two weeks, I mean like the people at sort of, you know, Britta and I, the people here who've been attending this conference for a while know Britta, we, we met and maintained more personal space from the community. I mean, we ended up in situations where it's just like it started to feel like they were like weird parts, even like the, some of the semi-core developer, developer group were just hating on us for because we happened to be there the whole time and that Britta's job for example was to moderate parts of the community and that it was it started to get and this something weirdly continues to this day even though it's like I haven't been around for a while Britta's been gone for a while and they still kind of like hate on us in horrible ways all right what is history so human history um, becomes more and more the race between education and catastrophe HG Wells the fall of the web so there are a few things here, um, one of which is, is that there's this thing called Eternal September. And Eternal September was a notion that every year in September you would have the influx of, um, actually I, maybe I should, one transition, kind of like what am I doing now? The fall of the web, okay. Uh, Eternal September was this notion that every year at the universities there was September, and September was all the new students came, and all the new students didn't know how to use the internet, and all the students had to be trained in how to use the internet, and until then they were just, you know, acting really horribly and causing all sorts of problems and using all the core protocols and everything, and because of that, uh, everything was just like, just filled with like confusion until like, oh, but September's over, well, thank you. And then AOL decided to get everyone on the internet, which was good, right, and AOL, spent an incredible amount of money, like a $35 or whatever per user um, user acquisition cost, um, sending out CDs to just everyone. I mean, just, they just blanketed <laughs> CDs. Uh, and eternal September started, which, where we started getting influx of new users and it never stopped. Um, technology, we started seeing things like, I mean, when Steve Jobs announced the iPhone, he specifically stated that you were able to do um, uh, apps that were going to integrate perfectly with iPhone services and that they were going to, and that this was going to be the way that you build applications. And uh, I, mean, it's, I mean, we're now on like iOS 12, and we still don't have a way of doing notifications, uh, and we only have like some, some sort of weird ways of doing like bookmarking for icons. Uh, because what happened, right, is, is that very, very quickly, and arguably it's because of us, um, the, uh, they switched strategy months later to, okay, we're announcing an app store, we don't even have it yet, we don't even have an SDK yet, we're announcing an SDK, that's not even like an Apple sort of thing, to announce that they're gonna announce something, that's like really indirect. Uh, and so they announced they're gonna announce something, and then they eventually announced the thing, and then they eventually got to doing the thing, and now they're just like, that's, that's what it is, right? And so it's just like, web, web's dead. Um, politics. Uh, the internet has become the main battlefield for the public opinion struggle. President Xi Jinping in uh, August of 2013. Um, we, we started to see uh, that, uh, 
the internet has become so important that it is now something that just people need to be able to control. And they need to be able to control it sometimes for maybe obvious reasons, but also sometimes for indirect reasons. I mean, this is an obvious reason, but it's like, it's like, it's like a slightly more indirect political reason. So David Cameron from the UK, by the end of this year, when someone sets up a new broadband account, the settings to, in 2013, to install family-friendly filters will be automatically selected. Um, the, the premise here is that, okay, porn is problematic because we're very Puritan. Uh, and that because porn is problematic, we need to have default internet filters. And, they, and the default internet filters, to be clear, indirectly require you to have fully unencrypted internet traffic because if you don't have, like, at least like, you don't like, this, this is then the argument for um, why in like the new version of SSL, where um, they're trying to get um, everyone on board with um, server name indication encryption, and it's really hard because all the people who are in charge of these filters are like, but how am I going to implement this filter that I'm legally required to build if I can't see where the traffic is going? How am I going to be able to scan for viruses or whatever else if I don't know where the traffic is going? Here I pound include my talk from last year, which to summarize for anyone who's not uh, here, probably most of you weren't actually here, but it was a, the uh, centralized systems are bad. Storing data in one place is horrible. Uh, even the people that you trust, such as Google, are end up getting sued, occasionally lose those lawsuits. Um, we really should stop putting everything in centralized locations, which then leads to the argument for federated. Um, and so the failures of federated protocols, though, are long. I mean, running a server is just really hard. So federated protocols, by the way, like email um, was federated, right, originally. Um, just building websites and blogs, um, doing things like now Mastodon. Um, your account and identity are tied to the provider you're using, so you can't change which service you're on. Smaller services are more likely to go down temporarily, even permanently, which then kills your identity. So you don't want to use a small server. You want to get your email hosted by the big server. Servers, in general, allow for closed source extensions to the underlying protocol be deployed, even if the clients are still open source, which then we see the embrace extinguish sort of things been going on with email. Um, security across the boundaries of federated systems is very difficult. So there's good reason to use the same instance as everyone else you interact with. This is the argument for if all your friends use Gmail, you should use Gmail, because then your email will actually be secure. Um, the larger the provider, the better they are generally going to get on security policies. Um, internally, um, I actually kind of trust Google um, that they're not going to literally themselves have an employee look at my email uh, unless they absolutely need to. I don't like the fact that they have my email in one place because of hackers and governments and all sorts and like lawsuits and all sorts of things. But if I when I put my like there's a service called IRC Cloud. I happen to know it's like two guys. If you use IRC Cloud, and what you're effectively doing is you're probably just reading it occasionally. Um, larger providers see more data and use that to build better models for protecting users from both spam and attacks of various forms. Um, there are clear economies of scale on price, so the larger services tend to be cheaper. And so this has kind of like led to me, what am I doing now? And so I'm working on this, I'm the head of technology of this project called ORCID, and we're trying to build a new distributed internet, Silicon Valley season four. Um, but uh, I, we're doing some, something that I don't know if it's particularly well organized, but it's a 245 uh, that, uh, uh, to learn more about it. But, that's what I'm doing now after all of this history stuff. So what is history? History is more or less bunk. It's tradition. We don't want tradition. We want to live in the present, and the only history that's worth a tinker's damn is the history that we make today. This is Henry Ford. I don't know if I agree with any of this, um, but it's, uh, I figure that history is bunk would be the last one that I would do in that talk. Um, so yeah, that's it. <laughs>